far away. Yes, yeah. Did you call a warning? Yeah. Sakin said she was going to be here and then we don't hear. Oh, can you put uh, again this uh, picture where it is? Is it this? People are going to arrive. So, yeah. Uh, welcome, everybody. I think we uh, are going to start our event because it's, it's 11 o'clock. So we expect um, uh, our last speaker to arrive in, in a few minutes. He's on his way. Uh, and so I want to welcome you to this event organized by WECF in partnership with the Climate Technology Center and Network. Uh, and also the Global Environmental Fund, the GEF. My name is Anne Barr. Uh, I am a coordinator of the Gender and Climate Programs for WECF, Women Engaged for a Common Future, a member of the Women and Gender Constituency. I am also a CTCN Advisory Board member. And um, I am really happy to welcome you to this event. Why do we talk about bridging gender gaps in NDC implementation? Uh, looking at the landscape today at this COP28 with the climate emergency that is facing us and the very clear um, expressed reluctance from some parties to phase out fossil fuels, even though uh, the IPCC is telling us that is what we must do, we have no choice. Uh, we really need to have different approaches. Look at how we can uh, tackle the problems in a completely different way. And that is why WCF advocates for feminist approaches to implement NDCs and to in address these multiple intersecting climate, biodiversity and economic crises. So this event will facilitate a dialogue among uh, different bodies, among practitioners from the ground um, to look at uh, how we can have really a much more gender transformative approach of NDC implementation. So I have the pleasure to introduce our distinguished panelists, uh, Mrs. Trupti Jain from India. Uh, the organization is Narita Services Limited. She is an award winner of the Gender Just Climate Solutions in two 2018, organized by the Women and Gender Constituency. Mrs. Agnes Mirembe is the executive director of Aruve in Uganda, an NGO working on rural women's empowerment, uh, a partner also of WECF. Mrs. Uh, Patricia Marcos, Huidobro, Senior Climate Change Specialist at the GEF. Mr. Gersam van der Eist, Senior Policy Advisor of Climate Adaptation and also Gender Focal Point in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Netherlands. Big applause to our panelists. Thank you very much for coming. Mr. Stephen Minas, uh, who is a Technology Executive Committee member, is on his way and going to arrive very soon. So let me start first um, with a, a few words of, of introduction. 
We have organized this panel um, as um, the tech and the CTCN have partnered to uh, publish a, pu uh, a publication with a recommendation on how to uh, better integrate technology and see how technology can serve in NDC implementations with a lot of different case studies. And Mrs. Trupti Jane and uh, Mrs. Uh, Agnes Mirembe had the honor to present uh, case studies in that publication. I think the uh, publication is a very good tool to understand how gender matters in climate technologies. The CTCN has a gender and climate action plan and a policy. Come in, please. Hello, Stephen. And uh, I think uh, I will let Stephen Minas talk about this uh, in a moment. Uh, what we aim at with this policy is really to ensure that uh, gender, is, gender equality is mainstream into uh, technology and NDC implementation, and specifically looking at how um, technical needs assessment, technical assistances, do integrate gender analysis uh, of the different sectors, situations, country, territories, where uh, we need uh, those technical assistances, ensures also that women benefit from trainings, but also that we have more gender balance in the staffs that are implementing those technical assistances, as this does play a significant role in the approach. So. Um, with these uh, few words of, um, uh, of introduction and um, us being here at the NDC Partnership uh, Pavillon, WECF is a member of the NDC Partnership, uh, I also need to mention that the NDC Partnership uh, is uh, very much supported by the Dutch government uh, with a um, will to actually support more gender integration also in NDC implementation. That's the pleasure to, to invite you, Gersam. Let me now start by giving the word to the floor to Trupti Jane. Uh, Trupti, you have um, invented and disseminated a very innovative water storage uh, technology. Can you tell us a little bit about it? Tell us how the gender dimension uh, is crucial and central into your action. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Anne, uh, and uh, uh, distinguished uh, panelists and uh, sisters and brothers. Uh, I'm, I'm really uh, here to uh, talk about my innovative solutions that not only addresses the climate challenges, but also contributes significantly to breaking down the uh, structural barriers um, to the gender equality in climate technology. So in that way, this is a unique um, uh, process and technology. I bring your attention to the remarkable initiative known as the Bungru, as, as Anne mentioned over here. Bungru means is a big straw. Uh, in a uh, vernacular language, we call it Bungru, but in English, it is a big straw. Bungru is a sustainable water management technology, exemplifies the potential of climate action to empower the women and enhance the role in technology development and applications. So these indigenous systems originated from India, effectively travels, uh, harvest rainwaters uh, during the monsoon and store it in the underground. So basically it is the soil aquifer recharging technology where the excess farm water we are storing into the soil aquifer and lifted it out in the dry season for the irrigation purpose, uh, uh, where uh, there is no other uh, water is available for the irrigation. So from the farmers, zero crop to two crops they are taking in a year. So that's why they are not only changing the livelihood, I mean income generation uh, on a greater way for the farmers, but also provide them the dignified life because now they become the farmer and they don't have to migrate to the other uh, urban area as a uh, work as a bonded labor kind of the things. So it is, um, uh, they are calling it is innovation for the dignity also. 
now the uh, uh, things comes that in this technology, women farmers have played an important role to evolve this technology because uh, they want the solutions uh, of uh, their problems and which helps them to take care of their education and health need. Because by having the steady uh, accommodation in the one area, rural area, and stopping the migration to the outside of their home villages, also uh, empowerment, uh, I mean also provide them an opportunity for accessing better education education for their children and the uh, health situation. So they have uh, helped uh, evolve this technology with a great patience after six to seven years of the um, our uh, trial and error methods. So now the technology came, then the question comes about the co-ownership of the technology. Because one unit is, the water is not seeing the administrative boundary, right? So one unit served to the five to seven farmers. And where the women farmers take the ownership of this uh, technology, they come together sharing the water, not only sharing the water, but sharing the resources like the seeds and the fertilizers and the water cycles and uh, uh, the cropping patterns they are deciding and other things so that and they we have involved them right from the beginning so they are i mean involved in this technology they are maintaining it and they are taking the ownership of these ones they know the thorough about the technology so that ownership gives them the immense uh, uh, peer uh, pressures uh, and, and that helps them to survive the domestic violence also because the women doesn't have the land rights. Uh, very few women have the land on their own name and uh, so these kind of the co-ownerships of the water rights <laughs> uh, indirectly, it gives them the immense power in terms of the sharing the, their domestic issues. They prevent them from the uh, domestic violence uh, frequencies as well as uh, their economic uh, activity say is also increased are remarkable so uh, they are now taking part in decision making of the economic activities like where the money will go and where it will be utilized and something like that and uh, uh, that helps uh, uh, and that provides them the dignified life is that uh, their own social structure levels and that's why it helps to reducing the gender gaps over here Chupti, um, can you tell us maybe a little bit about um, some whether that helps also in the appropriation of the technology and uh, where some of the challenges have been overcome from their uh, experience in monitoring uh, the, uh, the Bungaroo, uh, the women farmers, what you have learned there in working with women farmers. Okay, yeah. So uh, basically women, I said women don't have any assets, right? Uh, they don't have the land rights. Uh, and they don't have any... Um, uh, so basically they are on their own, and the house is also not on their own uh, name and something. So basically they are suffering from the domestic violence because they, they don't have any place to go uh, if uh, they say uh, uh, fight with their husband or the family. So, uh, and they don't, don't have also access the formal credit systems because there is no, 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 nothing for them having to collateral their uh, things to the fin formal banking financial systems. So they, are, uh, um, so they are not accessing any formal credit systems and the financing access because, uh, and so they are excluded uh, community, I mean, uh, by default, by the policy and by bankers as a um, uh, access of the credit systems. And now now they are having the um, the water and they are having the some kind of the economic benefits from zero to two crops they are now accessing the uh, gathering togethers and mobilizing the money and uh, uh, they have some say in the financial systems, but the, uh, the way is very far because we need to lots of, uh, do a lots of things to access the former financial systems for them. And we work with the small uh, uh, self-help groups in which we came to know that uh, the women are uh, most honest in terms of a repayment of their small loans. <laughs> so I'm sure that if they are included in the formal credit systems and accessing the formal finance systems, women uh, will do wonder in terms of economic development. Many thanks and applause for Krupti. Uh, 
We will come back with a very concrete recommendation, so keep in your head some, some of that that you can do. I want to also stop here to mention that uh, we have translation, and uh, sorry that I forgot to mention that. Uh, thank you very much to our interpreters. So the in, in translation is from English to Arabic uh, for who, any uh, persons who would need it, and you have headsets uh, at the back. Let me turn now to Mr. Stephen Minas. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, Professor Minas, you are a member of the Technology Executive Committee and also of the CTCN Advisory Board. Um, the technology mechanism uh, introduced a collaborative publication uh, on uh, NDC implementation and technology. The tech also has a number of recommendations on gender. Uh, maybe uh, you can tell us a, li a little bit more uh, about both. Considering the findings, uh, can you give us some, share some of those recommendations and also as gender focal point, um, what are the objectives uh, of the tech there? Thank you. Sorry, uh, good morning colleagues, it's, it's uh, terrific to be here. Thank you for the invitation and great to be here also at the NDC Partnership uh, Pavilion. So as, as Anne mentioned, I'm a member of this thing called the Technology Mechanism under the Paris Agreement and the Climate Convention. A bit of background. The parties in 2010 set up an advisory committee, the Technology Executive Committee, to make recommendations to the COP and now also to the CMA on matters of technology development and transfer. At the same time, it set up this technical assistance body, the Climate Technology Centre and Network, CTCN, hosted by UNEP, to work with uh, developing countries on technical assistance, but also to do other work in this space. Now, in 2019, the COP in Madrid asked these two bodies, the tech and the CTCN, to collaborate with each other. You would think that this would have been there from the beginning, but this was something the COP saw fit to request in 2019. And then during that long period of the pandemic, those of us who were the chairs and the vice chairs were deciding what should be our joint activities. And the four of us were strongly of the view that gender and technology should be one of the first activities because this was one of the most neglected areas uh, in this particular process. So with the two plenary bodies, we agreed gender and technology joint activities and a joint activities on nationally determined contributions, NDCs, resulting in the publication that we're talking about now. Uh, and of course, gender is also prominently featured in that publication, uh, including this wonderful Bangru technology, which is uh, a, a big part of the story. And all of this work, of course, has been taken forward with the participation of the women and gender constituency, with Anne, of course, as, as a very valuable uh, representative of that. So if, if I can just uh, start with the, the publication, which was first launched in uh, Glasgow in 2021 and now with an updated uh, version this year, just to... Uh, yes, which, which can be found on the website. I'm yes. Sorry, we wanted to... Do we have it in the next slides or no? No, no, that's, that's fine. But just, just to make it slightly visual, um, that this is... Um, a, not specific to gender, it, it's about the role of technology in NDC implementation, uh, but it does include rep, um, recommendations on gender, a drawing, of course, from case studies, one of which we have already heard presented. Uh, so it, uh, I'm reading here, it highlights uh, success stories and lessons learned on update, uptake of technologies, including gender responsiveness as one of the selection criteria. So. Uh, gender responsiveness at the beginning of technology selection for NDC implementation. Um, also, and this is more to, towards process, uh, looking at gender um, and indigenous capacity building and knowledge sharing uh, in the process of stakeholder participation in the development and rollout of technologies in the context of NDCs. Um, so, uh, the suggestion that a gender responsive process is more likely to result in success, uh, including for some of the reasons that we've just heard here, uh, including uh, the financial reasons that we've just he heard. So, so, this is a publication which is very much recommending um, a participatory and gender responsive approach, as, as will be of no surprise uh, to, to anybody here. Um, uh, 
further recommendations in that direction. And, and I should say that this has all been submitted to the COP and to the CMA, uh, particularly the CMA, of course, as the governing body under the Paris Agreement, which is where we find uh, NDCs, uh, including uh, the case study from the WECF. Um, and this is something that the COP has welcomed, uh, both in Glasgow in 2021, but also this year in terms of the recommendations uh, contained uh, therein. Um, so I, I think that this publication is an example of how the tech and the CDCN and perhaps other bodies as well can mainstream uh, gender responsiveness and gender inclusion in their work. This is about NDCs, not specific to gender, but of course gender is a very important part of it. Now, I'm, I'm also asked to talk about our gender specific work and indeed there are a number of areas where the tech and the CTCN um, are having regard to gender matters. Uh, every CTCN gender, sorry, every CTCN technical assistance uh, includes a, uh, a gender component in the rollout of that work, so that is something built into the programming. Um, on, on the tech side, uh, there are a number of publications and events. Uh, currently, we are finalising a publication on gender responsive urban transport, which will be launched next year and has had some very expert input from uh, experts in that space. And in terms of the work of the two bodies together, uh, the gender roster, which was launched here, uh, again, with the invaluable uh, participation of the <laughs> women and gender constituency. Um, let me just finally uh, just comment on the COP and the CMA, because in the negotiations uh, on the technology uh, report, the report of these two bodies, uh, we find that the COP has highlighted a couple of very important uh, gender aspects. Uh, so first of all, uh, it, uh, it commends the two bodies on their work to mainstream uh, gender considerations. It notes the launch of uh, the roster and invites continuing mainstreaming of gender. Uh, but it also very importantly notes with concern uh, the gender imbalance of these two UN bodies, the Tech and the Advisory Board of the CTCN, and encourages parties to take steps to achieve gender balance by nominating more female members. So we, it's, it's another aspect of our work. Of course, we can go forward with, with gender activities and recommendations, but ultimately we do need to see gender balance in the people making the decisions. Um, if I can sort of put my party hat on for a moment, this is something the EU has been pushing. Uh, we will continue to push uh, together with other parties as well. Uh, but in the meantime, we'll continue to work together with the gender constituency, continue to work together with other stakeholders and partners to advance uh, gender responsiveness in climate technology. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, indeed, uh, I, I can also testimony that we uh, are lacking a little bit of that gender balance. But on the other hand, uh, what is really important is also the understanding of those uh, gender challenges that we are facing in implementing NDCs and also in implementing technology, uh, looking at how women access technologies, how they are supported to really uh, implement and monitor and upscale those technologies. And I think um, Trupti shared a little bit of those challenges that, uh, that she had. So that is why also in the updated gender policy and action plan of the CTCN, we decided to have an, uh, an element on uh, raising the capacities of the CTC and AB members themselves on gender, on understanding what is a gender analysis, for example, and what are gender indicators. So uh, looking very much forward to, to this. Let's turn now to um, Agnes Mirembe. So you, you are uh, providing another example of why a feminist approach to just transition is so important. Uh, to move away from polluting industries and from fossil fuels, as we want to have this at the end of this COP in our decision, we need to propose a bright future, a hopeful future for all, right? So tell us what you are doing to establish gender responsive energy transition in Uganda. Thank you so much, Anne, and thank you so much, NDC, for the partnership and the opportunity to share. Once again, my name is Agnes Mirembe, and uh, I work with Action for Rural Women's Empowerment, an organization, as Anna said, 
that really works to transforming and empowering women. Now, the energy solution action that we are implementing, first of all, addresses the a challenge of access to clean energy for women in the communities that we work with. Now, amidst the so many other roles that the women are really implementing in my community, one of them is really finding clean access. And so this uh, solution, energy solution that we are implementing, helps them really. It's First of all, it's decentralized. And when I say decentralized, it is really helping to bring all the community members, including women, to have a, a affordable, clean, and and really cost-effective energy. So it's community. It's a community-based innovation. So what happens is, when where I come from, the energy sector first of all is dominated by men, and so women have not had opportunities and participate. Uh, you know opportunities to participate, and yet the people who draft our uh, policies who do not really understand the gender issues for the women, and so we first of all execute our a participatory process, an informed process, where we do an assessment of the women to understand what their energy uh, really uh, needs are, and so it's from that informative process, participatory process, where women them, the women themselves advise us on the energy needs and also propose because it's the women who are most affected and so they clearly know what solutions would work for them. And so they propose some of the technologies that they would really want to have, you know, probably be trained on. What I should say that in the communities that we work with, no woman has access to national grid. So there is a lot of energy poverty. And so in the community, in the th what we do is to bring the women in groups because we really want to have an approach. Uh, we call them women-led, women-led cooperatives, renewable-led cooperatives. And so after they have decided on the technologies that we want, they want to actually uh, be trained on, I should say, for example, there are three technologies that are being promoted depending on what their decisions are, including biogas, uh, second is charcoal briquettes, and the other is uh, solar, photovoltaic solar. Now, depending on what the woman has really agreed on, we go through a capacity building session. Like I said, these women are not really having a lot of awareness and so what we do is to take them through a training of installation, a training on operations, a training on how they can monitor the use of energy that they really have. And this is practical training, manual training. This, in my community, is an area that the men had actually taken over. But now we have women, I don't know if you saw the picture that was portrayed, where women themselves are into really I mean, producing the clean uh, stoves, the clean energy stoves. They are doing the briquettes. They get onto the roof to get, you know, to install the solar, the solars. And, and this has really helped a lot because what we have seen, they meet in their groups, find time when they get the knowledge of how to do it and how effectively they, they can do it, then they get started with really scaling up in different communities. We have had an opportunity, because leadership is also very key in really ensuring that these technologies can happen. And so we have, op we have had opportunities to, tr to train, to establish leadership committees, what we call women energy ambassadors. So these ones extensively now go to educate even the men to break the barriers, to break the culture barriers, and helping people understand that men, women can also participate practically in installing these uh, technologies. And so we have had them try to educate the others. And these small local solutions, I should also agree with Truply, that they are, because they are, local, they are locally you know, owned, they have promoted a lot of ownership amongst the communities, but also sustainability because they really understand them and they can utilize them very effectively. We have actually also seen uh, a change in the attitudes of men because initially they did not know that we can, the women themselves can also participate in this and it actually 
helps to transform a lot of social and economic, you know, transformations and development. Because when the lady has access to energy, then they are sure that food is available. Because in, in where, in the communities that I stay, their population is increasing, food may, no, food may be there, but with no energy, then it means the community will not have, you know, will not provide food. So those intersectionalities, you know, making sure that, say for example, the biogas, the woman understands how it can be generated, the celery, how it can be put in the digester, and how it can actually feed the agriculture, the agroecology that they are using to increase production. And when increase, when we have healthy and improved food, you see that the gender issues in terms of feeding nutritious food is also really addressed. So we are seeing a lot of uh, these as local, local solutions really being scaled up. But the challenge really is, is around access to finance. Now, what we have done, because these are local women, and they, do, they really would have had an opportunity to scale up these uh, uh, local solutions in the community at large. But because we, they don't have access to grants, they do not have, like she said, they cannot take a loan. Loans are very, very costly in my country. The interest rate is so high, yet... How many percent? It's, Tell us. I took a loan myself because I wanted to put a solar system, connect, and it, the, for, for a year, I had to pay 20% and, uh, uh, for, for the year. So it is rate. really yeah. difficult for a local woman to have access, to have them really put this, install these systems in their communities. And uh, what we have seen working in the cooperatives, we have encouraged them to, to try and save it through a village saving and loan scheme. But these are very small schemes that really can, women can come, you know, from their produce, then put together the resources and say, for example, take these simple loans, depending on the bylaws, depending on, you know, they define and, and suggest gender responsive, say for example, interest on these small loans, but they cannot help them really scale, scale these in initiatives to you know, greater uh, communities. So that's where the biggest challenge is. But we have seen these local solutions working and impacting on the communities, especially changing the livelihoods of women. So I can so, break it here. I, I can compliment, but thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Agnes. I think to overcome these financial challenges, you're working on the cooperative model, right? So the cooperative model, if you can ju just say two sentences, but we need then to go to the next speaker. Okay, Please. so why the cooperative level? I mean, like I said, it's very difficult to bring the women together. And so this cooperative level gives them, you know, a collective voice, women come together to really get into a group. For example, the cooperatives that we are working with have about 300, 400, 500 women in, in collectively. And so it actually helps them, say for example, to take on the capacity building that we have mentioned. But not only that, it, it generates data that we use that we actually also supply uh, to the local local authorities in terms of demanding because they need evidence and so the cooperatives, the women cooperatives really generate the data that the policy makers want to understand and, and it has really helped because then from the cooperatives women go to their homes to start now decentralizing, pick one technology that they really want to have and then go implement it in their household and from the household we are seeing that this is really scaling yeah. up. Wonderful. So 500 women in a cooperative, that's really an upscale and, and a great potential. And I think really in your intervention, you have brought why in the global stock take we need gender transformative energy transition, right? We need data, disaggregated data in the uh, way forward and in, and in the guidance. Um, and also we need capacity building and here I'm, I'm looking at Stephen Minas as a message to the EU. We really uh, need a strong language on capacity building because it's impossible 
to implement NDCs uh, and also gender responsive technologies or gender transformative technologies without capacity building. Let me now turn to uh, Patricia Marcos um, from the Global Environment Fund. Uh, you know that actually we have been very inspired by the Jeff's uh, gender policy uh, and action plan when we updated the CTC and gender policy and action plan because uh, the, the Jeff has put a number of really progressive um, goals and objectives in that policy as well as a system of uh, indicators and tracking to make sure that we make progress there. So I would like you to tell us a bit how you collaborate also with the CTCN as the Jeff, and how you mainstream gender in, in your uh, activities and policies, please. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for inviting the Jeff. Um, uh, it's a real pleasure to be here today, hearing these amazing stories. I was feeling really inspired. Um, so the GEF is the, uh, the Global Environment Facility is one of the uh, largest multilateral development funds. Uh, it was created in 1992 uh, to help countries address the most pressing environmental impacts. Uh, we also serve five environmental um, uh, um, agreements, including the UNFCCC and another one that was just created, the Global Biodiversity Framework Fund. Uh, so we work across different uh, sectors, not only climate change, but also biodiversity, land degradation, uh, chemicals and waste, uh, and uh, international waters. Just to give you a little bit of background, uh, and since the creation of the GEF, we have provided more than 22 billion in, in grants and blended finance, and we have mobilized an additional 120 billion in co-financing for more than 5,000 projects and programs worldwide. Um, so the GEF has a gender policy, as Anne was uh, mentioning before. I'm not going to get into the details. Uh, I'm going to provide you maybe some uh, more practical insights from, from the GEF. So, so it's a cross-cutting policy applies to all our projects, uh, independently of whether this is an investment project or whether this is a climate report uh, the countries need to submit to the UNFCCC. Uh, all of them, they have to comply with our uh, gender policy. Uh, the gender policy was um, updated in 2018, and it includes the, I guess, business as usual elements like a gender analysis and action plan, uh, gender measures, uh, gender indicators. Uh, you probably are all familiar with those, but I think I wanted to share something as because well, I'm a senior climate change specialist and not the gender specialist of the Jeff. Uh, fortunately, my colleague uh, couldn't make it today, so I am here replacing her. But I'm going to give you maybe a little bit more of a practical information on how uh, we do that at the GF. Um, so I am a climate change specialist, so I do review proposals. And before 2018, uh, the policy requires a gender action plan. So I was, I was reviewing the project, and I was, OK, this is Verona, right? Verona is the expert. She's going to review this, and, and that's fine. And it's usually, it's usually an attachment to uh, the main proposal, right? But since then, we have changed our templates. And, um, and gender has really been mainstream in, our, in the design of our proposal. And I think this is really makes a difference in the sense that uh, we are not just requiring an, a gender action plan, which we do, and we require indicators. But now, gender is really mainstream across the document. Uh, so it's not a, a separate section anymore. Uh, so every single outcome, uh, output, activity, there has to be. Um, an indication on how they're gonna, this specific out outcome is gonna be gender responsive. Uh, for instance, if it is on, on, on the more pilot side, uh, whether the pilots, they're gonna uh, include uh, women, I don't know, for instance, during the construction of uh, a solar power plant. Uh, if it is more on the capacity building, whether the capacity building, uh, like 50% of the participants, they need to be um, uh, women. So now it's not just my gender colleague, but I, as a technical specialist, re reviewing that proposal, I need to make sure that a gender is mainstream. And I think this has been a change in the, at least the, um, you know, like in the Jeff, a change of the, the people, the te more technical people. And we are now working more in collaboration with our gender specialist. I, I just wanted to share this because I think this has been a turning point uh, in how we uh, mainstream gender. Um, so gender is, um, 
uh, is mainstream across all our stages, like from the design of the proposal, but also during the implementation and also during the uh, medium term evaluation and terminal evaluation. So all of them, they have to report on how gender has been uh, mainstream and addressed. And for us, uh, for projects to be gender responsive, uh, it on, I mean, it means also developing policy in pla policies, plans, and strategies with gender experts and a women's contribution. Uh, women have to be included in leadership positions and decision-making roles, and uh, introducing measures, policy, regulations for women to have equal access and rights to resources. So it goes beyond the business as usual analysis, gender analysis, and action and action plan. Um, other things that I think are important to highlight and maybe a little bit um, different from the from the gender um, uh, side is that uh, we produce uh, an annual gender report that we submit to our council and it's, be, it's been reviewed. We provide uh, on an annual basis, annual basis examples of how successful examples of how projects have been gender has been mainstream and successful stories of gender in our projects. Uh, I would love to <laughs> have one of those uh, examples like you. I think that was really inspiring. And then maybe the more uh, remarkable remarkable thing is that the gender the Jeff has a gender partnership. Uh, it's basically um, a network of uh, focal points for gender. Uh, it includes, obviously, the GEF uh, gender focal point, but also every of our implementing agency has a gender focal point that part be, is part of this network. And each of the different conventions that we serve, they have a gender um, also focal point that is part of the partnership. So there are plenty of, um, of uh, engagement opportunities within the GEF uh, gender partnership, like at COP, they've been quite active uh, in our council meetings, in our uh, um, assembly meetings of the GEF, they meet, it's just a space to share lessons learned uh, with uh, uh, other um, uh, partners, with all the stakeholders. I, they have done really uh, amazing job, uh, and all the information is in our website, but I'm happy to provide more information if you want. Like for instance, one of the um, uh, one of the capacity building activities they provided, they develop a, a gender and environment e-course uh, in 2017, uh, and has been quite successful with more than 40,000 users uh, since it was it was created. So that's um, a little bit about the uh, um, activities we do on uh, on gender, um, and also wanted to highlight um, a specific program that we have. Uh, so the gender works, uh, the Jeff uh, Global Environment Facility works through our main um, recipient countries, right? So countries at the beginning of our four-year cycle, they know how much resources they have. And through their GEF operational focal points, they decide uh, which projects they're going to implement, right? Like, for instance, some countries, they do prioritize electric mobility in the country. Other countries, they do prioritize uh, biodiversity conservation. And the GEF realized that uh, uh, most of these projects, um, sometimes they do not reach the um, women and the civil society organizations, and they're more... Uh, uh, um, designed and implemented at a more high level, um, um, uh, high level um, way. So, so the Jeff uh, in uh, the early uh, its early stages created the Jeff Small Grant Program. So it's a program where uh, it's led by communities, small communities and communities and projects. And I really encourage you to apply if you haven't done that. <laughs> Uh, we provide up to uh, uh, 50,000 US dollars directly to uh, CSOs, uh, particularly those that are led by youth and women. And uh, it's really a project that is implemented in the ground by the communities. Uh, they can have, they still have to go through our procedures and, and, uh, and bureaucracy, I guess. So they have to go through one implementing agency, but it's really, it's really having a lot of impact on the ground. And it's been a really successful um, program. And I have the, the, the um, information there. I think so far it has supported more than 25,000 grants. And about 395 million have been allocated to support community solutions to climate change mitigation and adaptation. So this is just to climate change. Uh, as I was mentioning before, <coughs> sorry. 
like we mentioned before, we also work on biodiversity, land degradation projects. But just to climate change, we have allocated more than three, 395 million. So I think this is a really nice uh, initiative, which actually has been uh, revisited. And we now have the small grant programs 2.0 where countries can also complement their contributions to the community-led uh, activities. Um, uh, and uh, we are launching soon, stay tuned, two initiative, uh, one on innovation projects at the community level, um, at the community level, and another one on microfinance exclusively for women. Uh, this is still to be, I mean, it's in the making, but uh, it's expected to be up and running uh, within the next uh, calendar year. So. I just wanted to share that. Sorry, I was talking too much. <laughs> I, I would just like to uh, let some time for also uh, the audience to ask some questions. But congratulations and, and thank you very much. I think uh, small grant programs uh, is extremely important to make sure that finance reaches uh, the local level. Also, yearly reports, progress reports on gender uh, implementation, gender mainstreaming is really is really important. Thank you very much, uh, Patricia. Let's turn now to Mr. Gaston van der Elst, your senior policy advisor on climate adaptation in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Netherlands. Uh, you, th your government has contributed uh, substantially to the NDC partnership, uh, wanting also a strong gender dimension. You also recently organized uh, an international conference on feminist foreign policy. So tell us, what is your approach of feminist climate uh, policies and how inspired are you by these two case studies that you have just uh, heard from today? Thank you very much, uh, Anne, for, uh, for hosting this meeting and also to the NDC partnership uh, for having me. And thank you to all the panelists um, I'm, I'm really inspired uh, to, to answer your, your question uh, head on. Um, I think it's, it's great to, to hear from, um, yeah, from real examples from the ground, uh, from the passion, the innovation uh, that you use to, to come up with, with, a, with a solutions on water, on energy. Um, and I think it's often that uh, maybe from the Netherlands we, we want to uh, to provide support, uh, capacity building, maybe share some of the technologies that we have on water or in agriculture or on energy. But I think that all this, that your examples actually show that it's not not about that. It's actually about providing space for your innovations, for solutions that uh, that are really from the grassroots. So. Uh, and that's also something that we really want to support. Uh, let me also briefly respond to the other panelists. I think it's uh, it's amazing to hear about uh, the new Jeff uh, gender policy. And as the Netherlands, we've also really supported uh, an ambitious uh, policy because we also depend on how you do on gender because we support you financially through our climate finance. And um, yeah, if if those policies are not in place, we won't be able to have gender responsive, gender transformative action actually. And um, let me also briefly respond uh, as also a member of one of the constituent bodies of the UNFCCC, I think it's really important that these bodies better integrate gender in, in their ways of working. And uh, gender balance is a very important entry point in these bodies. And I think there's a lot that can be improved still. And uh, hopefully we will be able to work on that also in the new gender action plan that we hope to agree on next year. So the other reason why I'm very grateful to be here is that two of my passions, gender as the Netherlands national focal point for climate and gender, and uh, the NDC partnership as also our NDC partnership focal points come together here. So we support the NDC partnership to do capacity building to help with technologies uh, for instance, technologies related to uh, to water, water and energy, um, but also to integrate gender more in the NDC. So I think the NDC partnership really plays a very valuable and crucial role here. And then on, uh, on gender, uh, my government has recently, last year, adopted a feminist foreign policy. And um, that policy is really about the four R's. It's about strengthening rights, representation, mobilizing more resources, and a reality check. I'll come to that later. So um, I think at the heart of the policy is 
taking a feminist approach, where you also reference that. So it is, it's not only about gender responsive actions, it's actually about gender transformative actions. And it's not only about gender, it's also about taking an intersectional approach. It's also about youths, indigenous people, about broader inclusivity. So um, therefore, I'm also proud that as the Netherlands, we at this COP, we endorse the diversity and inclusion principles. And in terms of representation, we're trying to also do what, uh, do what we preach. Uh, by also in having uh, a gender balance within our uh, negotiation delegation, for instance. Um, let, me, let me turn to some of the examples. We, what we can do, uh, the Netherlands is, is, is a donor mainly, and we, uh, we don't have all the knowledge. We are not on the ground everywhere where the real change needs to happen at the grassroots where, where, where you are. So what we are doing is trying to support different organizations with our climate finance. And on the one hand, we are trying to make climate finance through the GF, through other funds, more gender responsive, better integrate gender there. And on the other hand, we are also attempting to support women-led organizations. And I think that's, that's really what we, are, what we are aiming to. And we have the SDG5 fund, which is broader, uh, it has a broader purpose to support gender and that's a relatively big fund it has over 500 million in it so we're also trying to integrate climate better in uh, the the finance we have available actually to support integration of of gender and one of those programs we are supporting for instance is leading from the south it's we are providing finance to uh, women's funds that then sub grant to the real grassroots because yeah, we don't have that knowledge and expertise, so we really need the partners to work with. Other programs, for instance, that we support through our climate finance, and that's also with our partners for, from WECF, it's uh, also at um, supporting women that are fighting for their land rights, I think, as you mentioned. Uh, we have, um, yeah, I have an example on uh, supporting women that fight for their land rights to be able to manage their forests better. Uh, that also help them develop uh, businesses based on non-timber forest products uh, and that help conserve the forest but uh, and also use the ecosystem benefits of the of the of the forest while they have the ownership and the, uh, the representation there so very briefly uh, in conclusion uh, we are we are far from there yet uh, and I think this type of dialogues are increasing are very important to have a reality check of what is actually needed what is happening and uh, I think therefore very grateful to be here and um, continue to work with all of you and uh, uh, yeah further support gender in the NDCs in climate in general <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, um, thank you for bringing in also the intersectional dimension, which is really uh, extremely important, looking at all the different layers of inequalities that uh, really are a lot of different groups of our societies are facing. Uh, and so looking also at, at age inequalities, uh, also uh, gender diversity, uh, and also people with disabilities. I think this uh, discussion is also one that needs to be brought into our uh, negotiations, and it's really important that we implement it on the ground. Uh, I would like now to open the floor uh, to the audience. If you have a, a question to our panelists, uh, we have about five minutes, five to eight minutes. Uh, so please feel free to ask a question. Clive? Uh, we have a microphone. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you so much to the panelists. Uh, I, I, I would love to direct the question to the GF. Uh, in regard, first of all, thank you for upscaling up that fund to the local uh, uh, entities to really do such kind of uh, interventions. However, I don't know the mechanism that are in place to just ensure that uh, these funds are accessible is usually the main challenge. 
Uh, I don't know if you can give a little bit of concrete aspect on how accessible these funds would be, but also uh, whether we're talking about localization and we're talking about giving capacities to uh, women-led institutions uh, like the AROA in ensuring that they participate uh, in policy making processes that define the aspect of uh, uh, emphasizing uh, gender uh, aspect in all, uh, in all adaptation mechanism. Thank you. Can you just quickly introduce yourself? Okay. Uh, uh, Clive uh, Chibul, I come from uh, Zambia. I'm one of the actually uh, uh, winning awardees in 2018 under uh, the WECF uh, uh, Gender Justice Award Solutions. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you for the question. That's a really good question. And I was uh, going through my talking points and I realized that I haven't mentioned even half of the things that I wanted to mention. But um, uh, in the small grant programs 2.0, um, each country has, each of the, our recipient countries, they have had to one million to access for the this program. Uh, and again, it's between like each project and have up to 50,000 US dollar approximately. Um, so how the GF works and how it is structured is that we have, so the disbursement of our funds is done through one of our implementing agencies. We have 18 implementing agencies, but particularly for the small grant programs, as of now, it is only UNDP, the one who um, can uh, channel those resources. Um, we will, um, we will extend to other of our implementing agencies, most likely in the next few months, but uh, right now it's, it's basically UNDP. Uh, and uh, yeah, they usually launch within the country like a call for proposals, uh, and then the communities, they can submit their proposals to the, uh, to the country, and then there is a selection, and then they are submitted to the GEF. Um, I can give you my card, and I can direct you to the uh, the, all information is in our website, and also uh, UNDP has, uh, there's a website just for uh, the small grant programs where all the information and also the focal points within the country, that's easy. The, um, accessibility is extremely important, um, and that is something that is not always uh, understood as financial institutions look first as at the financial risk that they might have, uh, but... Um, yeah, have difficulties understanding how challenging that can be, some of the criteria can be. Uh, I, I would like to give the floor to two, panel, to two uh, persons in our audience who ha have also questions. Introduce yourself, be very brief, please, in your question, and then uh, pass the mic to, uh, to your uh, neighbor. Hello. Thank you. Uh, this is Javed from Pakistan. <clears throat> I am also one of the grantees for Gender Just Climate Solution in 2020. And we are working for adoption of women cotton workers regarding the climate change. I'm just uh, asking one question from this and, and, and from the Dutch ministry here. Yeah. Uh, Pakistan has been suffering a lot from the climate change since last decade. But the JF Small Grant Program has closed its office from the country. And now it has been handed over to the government. So how you, do you see that this will be, you know, uh, you know, supporting for the civil society organizations to get this fund? And the question from the, the Dutch ministry that Pakistan has been the little attention uh, uh, regarding the bilateral and development cooperation. Although this year from the scholarships, you know, the list from scholarship Pakistan has been removed. I mean, there, 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 there is the linking of the just transition from the climate impacted country and, you know, uh, kind of uh, uh, support from the development cooperation. Thank you. And, uh, and the other question? We'll take both questions at the same time, so please, yeah. Ah, en français. <laughs> Allô, allô. Je vais m'exprimer en français parce que mon anglais, je suis débutante. Je suis Madame Biliga Koyivogi, point focal genre et changement climatique à République de Guinée. Uh, this lady, Mrs. Biliga Koyivogi, Koyivogi is from Guinea. She is the gender focal point. In the Ministry of Environment and Sustainable Development. Du côté de la Guinée, moi, je suis fier parce que notre CDN a déjà intégré les genres parce que moi-même j'étais membre du comité climat. 
So she's very proud that her government has an, uh, integrated gender into their policies. Maintenant, notre problème, maintenant là, on a actuellement le draft de la stratégie nationale genre et changement climatique, mais nous cherchons maintenant le financement pour le recrutement d'un consultant international pour finaliser vraiment euh, euh, ce, ce, cette stratégie-là et assortir d'un plan d'action pour la Guinée. So Guinea has a national strategy to integrate gender into climate actions uh, with an action plan, uh, and they are looking for funding to implement uh, this strategy and action plan. Au niveau de la technologie dont vous parlez, le ministère de la Femme n'a fait pas mal de choses pour des femmes rurales, pour la technologie, comment les apprendre à faire des, des ventes en ligne. So for example, uh, they are looking at the digitalization to support uh, women who are uh, commercializing different products uh, to have access uh, to digital tools uh, for uh, commercialization and have broader markets. Maintenant, j'aimerais savoir, comme on est avec les uns des euh, partenaires de CIP, je suis très contente de cette initiative concernant la promotion, la politique, le thème d'énergie, parce que tout va dans la promotion du, du genre pour le développement de la femme. Maintenant, j'aimerais savoir quel est le mécanisme que vous avez mis en place par rapport euh, comme à l'appui technique et financier au, nif, au niveau des différents pays pour ceux-là encore qui n'ont pas encore mis en place leur stratégie à sortir d'un plan d'action. Vraiment, qu -ce que, quelles sont les mesures que vous avez prises par rapport à ça Parce que moi, au niveau de la Guinée, je pense que cette stratégie, une fois que c'est mise en place et à sortir d'un plan d'action, on pourra concilier les trois eh, conventions de, de Rio, changement climatique, désertification et biodiversité. Tout va se retrouver dans ces plans-là. Je pense que ça va nous aider. Donc, nous, nous, je demande humblement les organisateurs d'aider la Guinée pour ça. Je vous remercie. Merci. So, I think the, the question might be also directed um, uh, to governments, to parties, but maybe also to the NDC partnership as, as an organization that actually finances uh, implementation and capacity building on what are the mechanisms, what are the plans to support countries who have drafted strategies but are now faced with uh, a, a big challenge that is how to implement it. She also thinks that um, if this strategy is implemented, that would really help bringing synergies between the three conventions, the Convention on Biodiversity, the Convention on uh, Desertification, and the Climate Convention. And uh, so uh, I'll give the floor to those who want to answer in a really just a few minutes, because we are already running out of time. And don't forget the question also from Javed, please. Thank you. So, challenging, who wants to start? <laughs> Okay, maybe maybe I can. Thank you. Uh, my French is not really good. <laughs> I could understand, but I speak in it's another thing. So sorry, I'm gonna speak in English. Um, so as for the Jeff, uh, uh, that's a really good question. Um, and I maybe I wanted to say that uh, most of the Jeff funding is uh, assigned to the government, right? And then the government decide based on their priorities how to allocate those resources among the different. Uh, sectors that uh, environmental sectors that the GF is supporting. Um, what I can tell you is that at least for us, we do require that um, whichever project is put on the table, it has to be aligned with the priorities of the country. It has to be aligned with the um, uh, with the strategies of the country. So in that case, we always ask for actually as part of our gender action plan, what is the, the action plan, the gender strategy of the country? Is the project aligned with that? How is the project supporting the strategy, the gender strategy? So that's, that might be not enough, I don't know, but this is one part of it. And actually, if there is any, um, so the GF also works a lot on, because our funding is limited compared to, for instance, our sister fund, the GCF, the Green Climate Fund. We do um, distribute our resources among all our countries. So each country receives an allocation. All other funds like the GCF, uh, they support, uh, you know, first come for service on the project. So because we distribute our resources, the funding is limited. So we are working more on the upstream level, like enabling environment and regulation. And any potential, any, any help that you may need on updating the, uh, the strategy that is aligned with the 
a specific technology that is being proposed in, the, uh, uh, in a project uh, could be also part of the project, you know, like creating an enabling environment for gender actions within a specific technology. It could be e-mobility, it could be green hydrogen, which is now is, we are receiving many proposals. So this is one entry point, I think, uh, for your country, uh, or for you as uh, how to mainstream this strategy and, and going through the strategy to the really implementation of the project. I, I have to cut, cut a little bit, but I think Stephen and uh, Gaston want to say just a few words. Thank you. Very, very briefly indeed. Um, merci pour votre intervention. Um, the CTCN funding is even more limited than the GEFS funding, but what I can say is that digitalization is one of two key enablers in the new program of work of the CTCN. So if you are looking for technical assistance regarding a strategy of digitalization, uh, this would be very core to the work of the CTCN, and uh, you would be very welcome to approach the Secretariat. Thank you. Je traduis juste. Stephen Mines vous recommande de, de déposer une demande d'assistance technique auprès du CTCN. Uh, ce sont des, des mécanismes qui sont au niveau des pays, des gouvernements. Uh, et donc, uh, la digitalisation étant une des priorités du CTCN dans son nouveau programme de travail. Thank you very much for your questions also. I'm happy to provide my card and go into further details on the specific case of, of Pakistan. Uh, perhaps to answer the broader question, I think there is of course a much larger need than there is funding available, but I think there, are, so we, yeah, we would, we need all, we all, we all need to work on, on making more funding available uh, also but also it's about accessing the funding that is available currently. And I think that, for instance, the NDC partnership is doing a lot of work. They're doing great work in supporting countries in making sure that they are able to develop uh, the proposals that can be funded by any of the NDC partners, for instance. Uh, I'd also like to point to the, maybe not only the NDCs, but also the national adaptation plans. Uh, I'm part of the least developed countries expert group and also the LAC is doing a lot of work in helping countries in writing proposals to then also have them submitted to the GF, to the GCF for instance. And I mean from the Netherlands we remain very committed to, to support uh, countries with, with, with climate finance and also for instance doubling our adaptation finance. So uh, yeah, we hope to do our part as well. Thank you. Excellent. Yes, uh, I think maybe I can, start, I can uh, conclude this event in one note. Um, I had planned to have every panelist give a, a last recommendation, but I will close on one because we are so much focused on finance here. And also our negotiations are, are really focusing on our uh, next uh, quantitative goal uh, on climate finance. Here uh, we hear that uh, we need to have bankable projects. and. From our side, we're coming in and saying, well, actually, we need to change the system. I think um, Trupti, uh, Trupti's case study in the publication of the tech and the CTCN gives a, an excellent example of how the system is not working for the people. Uh, the Ministry of Rural Development in India proposed to set up a loan for farmers to access Trupti's technology. Now, the condition for accessing the loan was to be a landowner. When women are not landowners, they are automatically excluded from this financial scheme. So how can we change the system so that governments or banks or financial institutions will not set criteria that automatically disregard those who need these technology the most? So I think I will let you with this uh, thing in mind <laughs> and think about how we can change that. Thank you very much.